Hi everyone, and welcome to the TLC Symposium Series, How Do I Know If My Online Students Are Really Learning, by Dr. Wendy Bass. I am Nikki Trombley. I am the Digital Solutions Specialist for Psychology, and we really appreciate you taking time out of your day to join us with Dr. Wendy Bass. We will get started now, but if any of you are having any issues with connecting to the audio portion of this, you may not be able to hear me talk at this point, but you can go ahead and join the audio conference by clicking on this. So there's just a few of you that are still connecting via audio, but we will get started right now. Um, throughout the course of the presentation, feel free to chat your questions to us. If you go ahead and chat your questions to the host, presenter, and panelists, that's me and Wendy, we will be able to take those chat questions and read them out loud to everyone so that at the end of Wendy's presentation, we're going to do about um, 15 minutes of question and answer. So if you do have questions throughout, please feel free to chat them, and then we can address them at the end. Also, at the end, we will open up the um, question and answers session so that you can also raise your hand on your screen and we'll be able to unmute your line and you can ask your question out loud to Wendy. But we're going to jump right in and in introducing Dr. Wendy Bass. Um, Dr. Wendy Bass is the Distance Education Coordinator and Project Director of Title V Grant at Pierce College in Woodland Hills, California. She obtained her PhD in education from the University of California, Los Angeles. Her early research and publications explore early literacy, identifying and supporting children with special needs, and the importance of parent and professional support in helping children with cancer return to school. Dr. Bass has been a passionate instructor of both traditional and online courses in psychology and education since 1998 teaching in both two-year and four-year schools in California. As Pierce College's Distance Education Coordinator, Dr. Bass teaches online courses while establishing campus-wide pedagogical standards and operational procedures for online instruction. She is co-chair of the LACCD Technology Policy and Planning Committee and serves on the college's Educational Technology and Accreditation Steering Committee as well as in the Academic Senate. Prior to coming to Pierce, Dr. Bass was the Distance Education Coordinator and a Professor in Child Development at East Los Angeles College. Dr. Bass has also been in e an Etudes Trainer and Export for four years. She has taught over 20 Etudes training courses at both ELAC and Etudes.org. In addition to teaching the Introduction to Etudes, she has developed and taught an online pedagogy course for ELAC faculty. Wendy is also a lead instructor for Cyber Teachers Institute for Etudes. Dr. Bass is a frequent presenter and expert panelist. She has presented at numerous national conferences on best practices in teaching online, how to engage online learners, and encouraging critical thinking in online child development courses. So thank you so much, Dr. Bass. And I am going to turn the presentation over to you. 
you can pull up your slides. And again, if anyone has any questions during this, please feel free to chat them to me, and I will read them out loud for the rest of the group at the end of Dr. Bass's presentation. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Um, hi, everybody. Um, my name is Wendy Bass, and um, that was a long intro about me, but now you seem to know a little bit about who I am and what I do. And I started teaching online probably about 13 years ago. I, I do, like, based on my kids' ages. And I know it was when my middle son, I was on maternity leave with him when I was developing it. And I just remember, this is pre all the automated stuff for kids. I remember using my foot and, like, bouncing his bouncy seat as I was, like, trying to figure out how to do some online stuff with my students. And um, every semester as I go to continuing education, I continue to learn more and more about how to best help our students learn online and kind of understand if they're really learning or not. So today we're going to be going through kind of what is learning, um, how to personalize your class, because I think it's really important. A lot of our students feel very disconnected with their online classes and their online instructors. So what you can do to help your students feel a little more connected to the online environment, creating an engaging syllabus. And the syllabus is basically a contract between you and a student, so it's really important, and it draws the students into your class. How to use the publisher's resources to lighten your load. I do that a lot because especially when you teach a number of online classes, you want to have the um, option to maybe make things a little easier for you. And student engagement and discussions. And that's probably the meat of my courses and what I recommend should be the meat of every course because to me, when we talk about how students are learning, that how they respond to discussion questions is the key for my classes. So what is learning? I just basically took this out of the dictionary. Knowledge acquired through experience, study, or being taught. And nowadays it's a lot different because the students have access to so many materials that they're learning a lot through kind of facilitating it online and looking it up. So we aren't you know, so much as teaching but facilitating the materials they have. And then memorizing your critical thinking. For some instructors, they're very happy when students are memorizing it and spitting it back out on the um, test for them. I really emphasize critical thinking because I want them to be able to leave my class knowing how to think about how children learn. And so sometimes when you memorize, you don't remember anything. Um, I don't know about how many of you guys remember those college classes, but I have quite a few that I remember where I memorize information, and if you asked me something a day or two later, I couldn't tell you anything about what those classes were about or the material I was supposed to know. But the ones where you're writing essays and really thinking about um, discussion questions, you think about it because you're processing the information. So we're going to start with personalizing your class. And one of the things I always recommend is start out with an opening video and send it out before the semester starts. It's really easy to create videos. Uh, most of us have smartphones. Um, I did this one in my studio here because we, um, we actually have a multimedia studio. However, I have used numerous, numerous videos where I just go right into my um, smartphone and make a video for my students saying hi to them. So I'm going to kind of click back and forth for you to show you. So this is what the, the video I send out to my students when, before I start the class. So you guys are seeing my screen right now. And this is, we use Moodle right now. So when I click Start here, hi everybody, my name is Dr. Wendy Bass and I'm going to be your professor here at Pierce College. Um, welcome to Pierce. For those of you that are brand new, welcome to your first online class. For those of you that have taken a few online classes, hopefully this will be your best one. Um, so I want to give you a few pointers about taking an online class. The first one is make sure you log in a few times a week. This is because you don't want to fall behind, and there's new information being shared all the time. The second pointer is make sure you ask tons of questions. Even though there is PowerPoints and lectures, there's still a lot of material that may confuse you, and that's what I'm here for. I want to be available to answer as many questions as possible. And also, when you ask questions, other students are oftentimes helping answer them, and that's really helpful, too. And so if you see a question from another student and you know the answer, that is awesome if you want to answer it. And lastly, please use full sentences. Um, we know that you're in college so that you're able to write full sentences. Don't use texting language. It's, people get so confused all the time. I, the letter I, should always be kept. So my intro video is more just about like kind of like some clues to the students, like what to do to be successful in the class. And obviously I have a feeling all of us are like this. This letter I, lowercase I thing for me with my students drives me a little bit crazy. 
So what you want to do is you can kind of like remind your students about what it is that you're hoping that they're going to get out of the class or how they're going to behave in the class. So this was a professionally done video, and I did not, I should have had my YouTube up, but, um, but I do a lot of other videos just because I want to um, be able to show my students, hey, you know, I, this is just a reminder of what we're doing this week. Actually, I can show you, I do this every week. And so let me come down to one of my weeks where I like have done a little video for them, not this one. We'll come back to that. Sorry. Okay, so play. Okay, so sending out the opening video. The other thing I do with the students is I try to make sure I have something called like helpful hints. And I continue to add to it every semester because if I notice a pattern of similar questions that always arise, it's helpful. So I go, God, every student kept asking when something's due. So I make sure in my class that I have down another helpful hint, something is due every Tuesday night at 11. And for my online class, I have something due every night at 11 because I don't want, not every night, every Tuesday night at 11, because I don't want my students to be worried about, oh my God, did I forget a due date? Did I forget a due date? I want them to really think about the learning and understanding the learning. And one of the issues is when you have students that are so stressed out about, like, if there's no consistency when things are due, they're sometimes so worried about when something might be due that they actually aren't learning the material. So I have something due every Tuesday at 11, and that's when everything is due. So there, I never change the due dates. It's very important to me that I have that consistency with my students so that they don't have to worry. And this is just an example of what a, how I create the helpful hints. I do a lot of visuals. I find that students respond to the visuals. I, um, um, and then I'm telling them, like, you know, you can log in every 24-7. So making sure that they get that done is really crucial for them. Um, use relevant and fun images. This is really important. Um, I think it's great because I like to be visual with my students. And you can create images based on terms in your course. And these are two sites, Wordle and Taggle. And why I love them both is you put in like terms. So I teach child development. So I put in all these different terms. And this is what I came up with. And this is the one I'm using right now, my tree. And if you notice, this has Bowlby, ADHD, Pavlov, resilience, Freud. So those are all words that I typed in and then it creates it into an image. And then I was kind of trying to have fun because I like to change it every semester so I remember, you know, the classes look a little different. So I did the Superman symbol with the exact same words. It does it all for you. And it's a free site. You just have to, you know, create an account and log in. And what you do is you download this resource that you download it and then you upload it right into your um, course shell. So I recommend that because it's a fun way to have the students seeing terms that they're going to remember, hopefully remember and um, makes it look interesting. Another important thing is to create an engaging syllabus. And this is one of my biggest um, things. Most of us now upload our syllabi instead of printing them out, especially because there's so much information on them. Because you're doing that, make sure that you have all the relevant information on it. You don't have to keep it short because you're Xeroxing it off. You can say, okay, I can make it a 15-page syllabus because it's online. So you want to make sure there's relevant information for online resources. Um, online support, where to go for the library. Most of our colleges all have online library resources. Um, if there's tutoring, we are lucky in that we're able to offer online tutoring. Technology requirements. So many of our students assume that they have the right technology for the courses, and they don't. For instance, I, I'm sad to say this, but with our Moodle um, uh, LMS that we're using right now, which we're actually going to be um, going away from next year, it is not compatible with smartphones. And one of the reasons why we're moving from it is because it is not compatible. And so many of our students are doing all of their work on smartphones and, techno and um, tablets. You can log into Moodle from your smartphone and your tablet. It's just not easy. It doesn't have an app that really works well with it. Visuals for navigating the course. That's important. Um, Students are taking classes at many different colleges, so they're getting really different LMSs. So sometimes they're going to be looking at using Moodle, sometimes they're going to be using Etude, sometimes Canvas, sometimes Blackboard. And so just in your syllabus, have something there that shows them where everything is. In Moodle, our discussions are called forums. To me, that like that's not necessarily intuitive. So we, I actually have a thing saying discussions are located under forums so that students know to go there to answer a discussion question. 
And also, have tips for success on your syllabus. Like I say to my students, log in three times a week. Just because it's an online class and things aren't due till Tuesday night, don't wait till Tuesday night to log in. And this is just an example of my syllabus. Because it's online, I can make it extremely visible, a visual. And I'm going to now click to the syllabus so that you guys can see it. I turn it into a PDF so that the students can see the syllabus from anywhere that on a smartphone, anything. They don't need a Word document for it. So I have like always, you know, the mandatory stuff, course descriptions and structure information, where to find me. I also have tools for success in terms of where to go for online counseling, Pierce Library. There's we use we have fun something called question points. They can ask 24/7 questions, um, questions to a librarian. Our online writing lab, also disabled student services. And then in California, they're pretty strict about student learning outcomes right now. So we all have to have our student learning outcomes on our syllabi. And then one of the things I took a class about on the Quality Matters training, and one of the things that they really talked about was linking our course objectives with our aligned weekly objectives. So I took the time to take each course objective and what we were hoping for each week and which objective, weekly objective it lined up to. And the same thing right here, it was very easy to bring in a visual of the book. So that a lot of my students are like, I don't understand which edition it is. Even though I'll say it was the ninth edition, they're looking, having the visual of the, what the picture looks like makes a difference for our students in terms of success. Grading policy, um, I just took a chalkboard and added, you know, some text box to it and, you know, said how, what the percentage is for everything. I used to have this in writing, just like in a paragraph form, and students weren't really understanding it, but when you make it a visual, it's something they understand. Really important, web etiquette. Um, students have a um, harder time understanding what something looks like in writing versus when you see someone's facial expression. So we've all had that experience where we get something in writing and we're like, oh my gosh, that was so mean, but the person writing it didn't really mean for it to be mean. So basically I want to kind of talk to the students about like being respectful to each other, not writing in all capitals because it's considered shouting, not belittling. Um, also, this is crucial as an online instructor, do not expect immediate responses to questions. Just because this is an online class does not mean that fellow students and or the instructor is always online and available. All questions will be answered within 24 hours, unless it is a weekend, then questions will be answered on Monday. I put that in there because even though I oftentimes do log in on the weekends, there are always some of those weekends where I'm just crazy mom and going to three soccer games and just did not have time to get near the computer. And so I'd rather have their expectations be that the questions will be responded to on Monday and have them be pleasantly surprised that I responded to their questions on the weekend as opposed to them expecting it. I'm sure you've all been in that situation where I'll get an email at like 10 a.m. on a Monday and at like 11.30 I get another email saying you haven't responded yet and I'll have been in the classroom teaching. There's no opportunity to respond. And so it's kind of important that we're, our role is also teaching students about etiquette online and what their expectations are and kind of tempering them because we live in such a digital world now that people think that, you know, we should be getting immediate responses. Go over class requirements. I have observations and exams. I also, this is really important, technology requirements. We know that with our Moodle programming that it only works with Chrome and Firefox. It does not work with Internet Explorer. I also do tech support as the GE coordinator here. So one of the first things I do when a student says they can't see their online class is I ask them what browser they're using. So it's really important to be aware that they are, um, they may not have that information or maybe using the wrong browser. This is where I have the, what I brought up about navigating the course forms or discussions are located in this tab. So I just take the, um, I take a screenshot and I write what this is um, for and where they'll find their activities. Tips for success. And then I always like a little bit of humor. This is my favorite little one. It just says, I'm really hungry. How do I enlarge the font in my alphabet soup? So that's just a fun little thing. We're gonna go back here now. So one of the things I've learned is to try, to, I got a little sneaky, and I wanted to quiz the inf students on information that I want to make sure they understand from the syllabus. Because what was happening is I'd get the same questions, and I'd be like, okay, it's in the syllabus, it's in the syllabus, and I'm like, they're not reading my syllabus. So I want to give them a quiz. It gives them experience using the quiz tool and also make sure that they are using the syllabus. Um, and then one of the things I did is I got a question from a student saying, I didn't realize something was due every Tuesday night at 11. I thought it was Wednesday. So I went back to her syllabus quiz, and I 
took a screenshot where she answered correctly that everything is due on Tuesday nights at 11. I sent it back to her saying, well, I, you know, I know you may not remember that you responded correctly, but you did know that things were due on Tuesday nights at 11. And so this is an example. And I even have, like, um, when they respond incorrectly in the syllabus quiz, I give them feedback, as you can see by what's yellow there. It, um, it says, according to the syllabus, how much earlier should I plan to submit a paper discussion form before the due time? And I tell the students three hours because the um, technology, you never know. Internet could be down. Something's wrong. You may have to run to Starbucks to get some free internet to submit something. So always be prepared. And the student answered 30 minutes. And I said, this is not correct. You want to give yourself at least three hours ahead of time. This way, if your internet or computer goes down, you have time to figure out how to get to a library facility with free Wi-Fi to get your activity submitted. So this is a standard response I give if they put 30 minutes. It's not that I have to go into each syllabus quiz and give that response. When I created the quiz, I put that down. So the sneaky part to a syllabus quiz, um, you can require students to use a password in order to get into the syllabus quiz. And you can hide the password in the syllabus, which is what I did. So I already showed you my syllabus. And under introduction, I talk about additionally, there is a syllabus quiz. You need the password toddlers to enter the quiz. And that's worth 10 points. So students have to really read the syllabus in order to actually get to the password to get into the syllabus. And um, same thing, it's because I want them reading it and understanding it. So being funny and interactive with your study. Your students, um, you have to make fun of yourself a little bit, especially online, because students, it, it, it sometimes can be a little dry just reading the material. So um, I do something during Thanksgiving called Face and Whole, and I tell the students we're going to do a Thanksgiving party, and I ask them to also go to Face and Whole and create some funny pictures. And we all upload it to a fun um, forum and share our pictures. And I just think it's a nice way to build community and have the students be excited and laugh and talk about each other's pictures. And you have to be willing to make fun of yourself as well. So I, I start the participation by putting myself in the turkey as well. And then more funny ways to share information. There is a... Um, there are really interesting ways to communicate with students. Um, you can use an animal or anime characters to share information. So even though I do regular videos, you can go to something called Voki.com and create a character that talks for you. And I'm going to show you this right now. Sorry, wrong browser. That's, here we go. Hi, everybody. Just wanted to let you know that the final will be opening up on Wednesday. And I know that most things are usually due on Tuesday night, but the final will be due on Sunday, June 7th at 11 p.m. So I want to make sure to emphasize that the final will be due on Sunday, June 7th at 11 p.m. So that's just a fun thing I do, because, and I periodically do that during the end. Uh, semester and my, um, actually the funny thing is my 10 year old loves helping me create them. He wanted to do the voice, but I said I think it needs to be my, my voice for them to be able to understand it better. But it, they, it is really fun and, you know, it's just a nice way to give a reminder to the students because if you just put it in writing, sometimes they stop reading the writing, but they do want to kind of hear with the dog. And I actually pulled up a Voki page so you can see what it looks like. And um, you can create different characters. And they are, it's, it's a free site, and you can make it an animal, you can make it an anime, you can change the background. Um, so however you want, you can make the players different colors. So just a fun way to share information. And then you'll click publish, and they give you an embed code, and that's what you bring into your class with you. And um, the next slide, I've been going over a lot of information is um, I, I wanted to see if there were any questions coming up right now. Hi, Wendy. Um, the one question I have right now is somebody complimenting you on your syllabus, and it looks wonderful. But this person wants to know what program you use to create your syllabus. I used Word, actually, and then I just kept putting in, so if you use Word, I just added visuals and, and colored in the boxes. So I would, like, put text, I used text boxes in Word as opposed to anything else, and then I saved it as a PDF. I know, it's amazing what you can do in Word now. Perfect. Thank you so much. And just a, oh, um, one other question just came in. Is the syllabus ADA accessible? 
we are being pressured to make all make sure all syllabi are accessible. That is a great question. So as of now, I just found out that anything that we create has to be Verdana 12-point font. So um, this just is coming down this week from our um, head of our district. So I will be changing the font in my syllabus to be Verdana 12-point font. And um, one of the things I do is I link the, all of those little blue things underlined. I have to relink them every semester, but I make sure they link and then um, the only thing I have to double check is I'm not sure if my pictures have alt tags because I don't know when you convert to PDF if it does the alt tag. So that is the only um, thing that may be an issue. And I'm going to be working on that as well. If I keep it as a Word document, it, then it, it would be fine because the Word document would keep it as a um, ADA compliant. It's changing it to PDF. So I may have to keep it as a Word document. It looks the exact same as a Word. I just like it. I think it's easier for students when they open up a PDF. And maybe I'll just post both. I'll post it as a PDF and as a Word. So if students do have disabilities, they have the option of clicking on either one. Perfect. And just a reminder to everyone that's watching, feel free to chat your questions to me. We will have another question and answer session at the end of the presentation, and we will be able to um, use the hand raise feature then if you just want to ask your question directly to Wendy. Thanks, Wendy. Thanks. Okay, so one of the things I do is I absolutely use my publisher's resources. And the reason why I do that is because I don't believe in reinventing the wheel. So they provide the PowerPoints with notes, and you can use the notes when describing the slides to students and save them as a movie on YouTube. I use, um, in California, there's an amazing grant through College of the Canyons, and they um, closed caption um, videos. So I send my links to College of the Canyon, and we, we do have to go some paperwork. But that's how I get make sure that my um, my videos that I create are closed captions. And when, so what I do is I take the publisher's videos and I add audio to them. And I'm going to link to show you. We're not going to watch a whole lecture because you guys will get kind of bored. But I do just kind of want to show you what a lecture looks like. So I'm just going to go into a random one. And um, so here's my PowerPoint, just a regular PowerPoint. And then I give them the option of a PowerPoint with audio. And those are something I created and uploaded to YouTube. Hi, everybody. Today we're going to talk about Chapter 4, which is about prenatal development and birth. We're going to start with the factor of fiction. Number one, an embryo is a developing human organism between the third and eighth week after conception. That is actually true. Number two, by the end of the third month. So basically what I did is I took their stuff, I put it in PowerPoint, and I added audio to it, and then saved it as a movie. And um, it's just a great way. You take it, you put it on YouTube, I house them all on YouTube, and then I embed them back into my course. On purpose, I do not send my students to YouTube, specifically because, like all of us, you get to YouTube and you start seeing, like, the dog skateboarding or something really cool that John Oliver did, you know, like, all these fun things you want to start watching, and we lose them. So my goal is to bring the students into, um, into my class. And I remember I was telling you about some videos that I do for the students. I'm going to just show you. This is a checking in one. This is my office. This was me doing a quickie video just saying hi to them. Hi, everybody. It is your professor, Dr. Wendy Bass. I just want to check in with you guys because we're getting into the fourth week of the semester. Um, one thing I want to make sure you're aware of is that I write comments whenever I give any assignments back. So for your discussions, I am giving you guys some comments, especially if you don't get 10 points on it. You want to know why? Go in and read my comments because I'm trying to give you some feedback to help you get um, full points the next time you um, submit. The main thing that some of you are forgetting is that and what you guys are going to notice is everything I have is closed caption. For those little one-minute videos, I closed caption them myself, and I actually forgot to include it in my presentation. But I have um, created a video for my faculty here on how to closed caption YouTube videos. So this one I did on. Hi, everybody. I am going to show you how to add closed captioning to your own YouTube video. So what you're going to do is you're going to click on the YouTube video that you and I'm going to, at the end, I'll, I can send that to you guys, but I don't know how to send it right now. But I can send you guys the link on how to add closed captioning to a YouTube video. Okay, so I'm going to go back here. Oh, actually, I think I can do it through here. Oh, I'll do it afterwards. 
Okay, so similar like I already showed you. And then more publisher resources. Um, you can pull discussion questions from the publisher's suggested lecture questions. Um, I did that because I was kind of struggling. I have a discussion question every single week, and I'm like, oh my god, I've got to come up with another question, and I can't always come up with questions that I think are really good critical thinking questions. The publishers give you some great suggestions, so I just pull from that. And then I embed the publisher's videos into my school's LMS. And this is just showing you an example. I have um, how I have my week set up where I have like lecture resources, I have weekly activities, and then I have other resources. And those are just the video clips. And they're fantastic, and they're already closed captioned as well. So that's one of the reasons why I like the publisher's um, uh, videos, because they're closed captioned for us as well. And then I started using, um, specifically for my Web Enhanced class, I'm using something called Launchpad. And this is something new that I just found out about, and it's pretty amazing. What I was able to do was take their material and create basically a course within online. And the reason why I can use it for Web Enhance but I can't use it for online is accreditation is looking to make sure that we're really teaching our courses, so they don't want us going over to the publisher's site for online classes, but they're absolutely fine if you're teaching a face-to-face -face class using it to Web Enhance or even a hybrid. But what I did do is I took my information and I embedded it into their shell and vice versa. You can bring it back and forth. So that was a really fun thing for me to like kind of play with. And like here's the intro to the course. And I'm going to show you, you already saw that I did this in mine. I could bring my video into their course and add it into it. I we don't have to play the whole thing again. And my closed captioning comes, everything comes with it. So it's just a really fun way, and you can add, like, you get to take pieces from it. Um, what I loved about Launchpad is it was almost, you have to decide how much work to give the students because there's so many different activities you can give to them. So you can click on whether you want to assign it or not assign it. Um, if you don't assign it, they won't see it. But there are so many options. And I added my um, discussion question that I was already using because I wanted them to have it. This is just an example of how you like set it up and when you want it to do and if you're going to assign it or unassign it. It made it very easy and I really love this. So I'm using Launchpad for the first time in the um, in the fall. So I'm going to get back to you guys with it. But it was it has been so much fun to kind of play around with and see all the different options I can do. There's like chapter reviews you can see um, a summary in the ebook and it just really nice beautiful and talk about being visual and a lot of the work is already done for you. Okay, so there was that. And then I have some more setup activities with due dates, um, use publishers grade books, so that's especially with the web enhanced, use publishers interactive activities, personalize by adding your own materials, and, um, and that was me showing that you can actually bring in your own stuff into it. So, I talked about the meat of the course. Like, to me, the meat of my course is my discussion. And someone had asked a question about how do you know that your students are really your students? Well, one thing I do is the best way to get to know your students' writing style is do an introduction. Because usually if you're just saying, hey, introduce yourself, that is usually the student just introducing themselves and saying, like, you know, this is who I am. And oftentimes when I'm grading discussions later in the semester, I pull up their introduction to kind of see if the style matches each other. So one of the things, this is my first semester that I tried this, and it was so much fun, is that um, I said, um, explain your major, and then we're going to try this fun thing. Um, name three things about yourself. Make it only two of the things you post are true, and let's guess for our class which one is not true. And so I started it. I said I have my PhD, but I'm also getting, my, but I'm also an MD and a pediatrician by training. My family and I starred in an episode of a reality TV show, and I jumped, jumped off a cliff when I was paragliding. And then I have the students go. I had like over 100 responses. The students had so much fun guessing what was true and what wasn't true for all of for each other as well as mine. And um, the funny thing is, a lot of them think I may be a pediatrician too, which was kind of flattering, but <laughs> definitely not true. But it was a great way to get started with 
getting to know their writing in a fun way so that if they are going to have like a ghost student doing the work for them, usually they're not doing the intro. And so that's the best way to have a very casual introduction to get them going. It also is a way, especially at my school, I don't know how your schools are doing it now, especially with the fear of financial aid fraud, to get them participating right away because if students don't participate, I automatically drop them because we need to make sure they're active students and are not just signing up for classes to get um, financial aid. So what is important about online discussions? You want to make the topic interesting and relevant. You know, oftentimes, um, the great thing about teaching in psychology and child development is there's always something in the news. So I even have a section that's just for discussions that's not even graded, where um, I think I saw a headline the other day, like, I'm why I'm feeding, breastfeeding my 16-year-old. Like, I didn't get a chance to do it yet because it's finals week now, but I would bring that in easily and say, okay, let's discuss. And it turns into a great discussion. It's not graded, but just bringing in really relevant topics. The students love that. Um, encourage timely participation. So my students have to submit two discussions. They have to respond to my question as well as respond to a fellow student's questions. And the way I have set up my discussions is that they cannot read anyone else's response until they do their first response. I figured that out after a couple semesters of teaching and seeing that the students that submitted last basically had the same answers as students that submitted first because they would just read everyone else's. They didn't even have to read the textbook. So now I was able to set up Moodle has something where I can set it up and Canvas that we're going to as well also has it where it's Q&A. So they can see my question and in order to see anyone else's responses, they have to submit their response. It takes 30 minutes because they have 30 minutes to edit, and then they can read anyone else's responses and respond to them as well. So they have to respond in a timely manner because if everything's due Tuesday at 11, if they don't submit the first response at, until 1030, they don't have time to respond to another student and they lose a lot of points based on that. So it does encourage them to also have to be a little bit on, more on time. Make sure the questions you're asking are open-ended, because if they're just yes, no, you will only get yes, no responses. Give choices. It's kind of more fun for me when I'm grading all these assignments every week to have them, you know, have them answering different questions. So I give, I try to give at least three questions per week, unless it's a really relevant one, like I do one on nature versus nurture. That one is the same question for everyone, because I really want them thinking about, you know, how we become who we are. Um, create a safe environment. So if a student doesn't answer something correctly, I never say you're wrong. I just try and, and kindly gear them in the right direction. And it require interactions with classmates. You know, all the research shows that students that are in online classes feel more isolated. So we, you know, our goal is also to try making them feel more connected. I just wanted to show you, this is my discussion rubric. And so one of the things I have is demonstrates understanding of course topics engagement with others and quality of prose. So in terms of engagement with others, does not respond to a classmate. If they didn't respond, they lose a lot of points. My discussions are 10 points each. And um, so it does make a difference if they didn't respond to someone. And then grammatically, I just, I have to grade on it because when they start, um, when they start to using texting language or the lower, you know, the lowercase i, or even, you know, one of the things we're working on is I sometimes will take their discussions and submit them to turnitin.com because we have a Turnitin account. Because some of my students do, you know, everyone says, how do you know it's really theirs? Well, sometimes I'm looking and I see exactly where they copied it from on the web. So, you know, it's important to do that. Um, also, if you notice underneath, there's this thing that says information you can trust. That's a link that I have, and it takes them right to this website. And one of the things I like about this website is they can look up resources by subject. Although they're still using the text, they can also use other things. And I want them to look on the internet for subjects that are accurate, that they know will have information that is, you know, current and relevant and valid. Um, you know, sometimes students will take from a People magazine saying, oh, and People magazine did that. And I'm like, that is not accurate. That's a story. And so, Part of, you know, what I try to do is teach them how to find accurate information, and so this is a great site to link your students to in terms of, you know, information to take them to that is accurate. And I've even used this site now with my, I, I've, I have an elementary school kid, a middle school kid, and a high school kid, and it's relevant to all three of them and information they're constantly looking up on the internet to make sure that, because my big thing with them is don't just Google, look to make sure it's accurate information. I want to take you back out again to show you a few more 
things that I have in the class. So um, I don't know how many of you guys use Mac, but I use a Mac because it's, I just happen to be a Mac user. And in Mac, you have something called Photo Booth. And so I have done some fun videos. Now you guys are seeing me. Hi. Um, and so one of the things I'll do with Photo Booth is this is sometimes I'll make my videos on Photo Booth for the class. So like this is Hi everybody, we're on a roller coaster and uh, just thought this would be kind of fun. Um, I just want to tell you what you should be doing this week. You should be working on chapter five. You need to do the crossword as well as submit um, the discussion. And this week you should be working on your um, observation on physical development. So that was one I made. I uploaded it to YouTube and then I added the um, the closed captioning, and that was sorry, and that is that ended up being one of my little check-ins with my students. Um, another one, I think I did one where I had like the birds flying around my head. Oh, here's one. Hi, this is just a quick example of how to. Ask. Oh, that was me um, telling them how to do. Hey, stuff. everybody! I'm in Yosemite. Uh, so these are just. So I try to do really fun videos with my students to kind of just get them excited about learning and um, sharing more information with them. And so all of these videos end up getting embedded into like my weekly activities with them. Um, so I also try to, and I want to show you kind of a discussion. I'll show you where my, um, my intro is to start here. Introduce yourself. Sorry, our server can be slow. So this is where all my students are like kind of giving feedback. And as you can see, it goes on and on and on and on. And it's just awesome because I love how many students are participatory in the class. And this just gets them so excited about uh, participating. And, you know, usually I have, a, it is hard, but I have about 60 discussions to grade sometimes because between every student submitting and every student you know, not submitting or uh, responding to other students, you do get tend to get a lot of information. And let me go to my online teaching shortcuts. So cheat sheets for comments. So I try to give comments. I make sure to give comments. I don't just use my rubric for grading, but I want to actually make sure that the students are learning. So let's say they aren't getting the information. I want to make sure they're learning the material, so I give comments. But oftentimes I'll find that students aren't learning the same material. So instead of rewriting the same comments over and over again, I'll have a Word document open next to me with the same with similar comments. I'll always personalize it with the student's name, but I'll give the same comments. I can copy and paste them. Um, oftentimes I'll use last year's comments. So, you know, next I don't change my discussions all the time. So if I know the discussion I already used last year or last semester, I can look at the comments I used from them and reuse those. Um, give yourself time to grade and have this in writing on the syllabus. Because our students are used to immediate gratification, we oftentimes have the students that are like, why isn't this graded yet? So I tell all my students that it will take at least a week to grade all discussions, and for big papers, it's two weeks. And that just gives myself some time to grade because I take the time to give comments. Um, use student-created content, um, for example, SlideShare. So one of the things I've done is, um, depending on the semester, I may or may not offer extra credit. And one of my extra credit assignments is the students have to take a topic within child development and create a PowerPoint presentation on it um, specific to that and add visuals, the whole thing. And then they upload it to a site called slideshare.com and then they set, share it with me. What I love about this is I'll say, can I use your content? And then I can add that slide share into my lectures now. So you can actually have the students help create the content and then add it to your lecture. Um, something I forgot to write down about as well is that um, you know, we all make, we all have grammatical errors and sometimes make typos. So I give my students extra points if they find any grammatical errors or typos in my lectures so that I can fix them. So it also makes them read it more carefully too because they think that's kind of fun. And then don't reinvent material. Use the publisher material, but personalize it for your course. It's really important to personalize it. You don't want to just take stuff and put it up there. And the students don't know who you are then. And I love it when I'm walking on campus and students come up to me and say, oh, you're my, you're my online instructor, you're ITQ for this, because they see so many videos of me or of my voice in, in a dog or sometimes I do this like vampire duck, that Boki has a vampire duck, that's kind of funny. Um, so just um, make sure you personalize your course and add your personality to it um, because I think that makes, keeps the students motivated as well. So, and that's kind of the end, and I want to see if there's any questions. Perfect. Thank 
Thank you so much, Wendy. Um, I am going to share my desktop just for a couple of different things that I wanted to point out. And at this time, please continue chatting me your questions um, and then let me know. I know a couple have come through email. We do have some questions that are coming in. Um, but just to let everyone know, we are going to be sending you a follow-up email and the email will point you into the right direction. We are recording today's session and it'll have all of the recordings from today as well as Wendy's slides that she will be, she will be providing to us. Um, but let me share my screen and of course I shared the wrong one, but continue letting me know what your questions are and I will be reading them in just one moment. Okay, Wendy, the first question we have is, why do you think it's still important to have video lectures on the textbook materials if it is a very readable textbook, because Burger is a very good book? That's a great question. It's more to me about personalizing the material. I think that there's so much material. When I do the video lecture, I kind of let the students know what's the more important material that I want them to know. Um, and so, and I do think it's so vital that I um, add myself to the course. Um, if you are just web enhancing, then you, you know, I wouldn't necessarily add it because they're already seeing you in class lecturing. But for a fully online class, I really want to make sure that they are hearing my voice share material and that I'm letting them know what I'm emphasizing because there is so much great material, but students don't always know how to narrow down what you really want them to know versus how much is on in the textbook. Perfect. Okay, the next question comment is, we mostly make videos to address specific questions for that group and often have to change it for the next time around. So creating captions each time can be time consuming and not cost effective. How do you do it with the least amount of effort? So it depends on the video. If it's, if it's two minutes or under, it's really easy to close caption on um, YouTube because that's, um, it's just, I do it myself. And uh, if you watch my video, it shows you how, I, I don't, I'm gonna date myself here, but I took typing as a class and so I, you know, we had to like get tested and I can type like 85 words a minute and, you know, we, nowadays I don't know if that's, it's a totally different generation. I watch my kids using their pointer fingers and it drives me crazy. But um, if you can type quickly, it's very easy to type up because you listen as you go. Um, I don't know how other states are doing it, but the state of California is really cracking down on ADA compliant. Basically, our college has said, if it is not closed caption, you may not use it. So you cannot create any videos for your classes that are not gonna be closed caption. Um, the only, from all the meetings I've been going to and trainings, the only way you can use a video that is not closed caption is if it's a current event thing that you taped the night before that you're using once like because it's irrelevant to your course, specifically like a poly sizing with the election results or something like that. So um, if, it's, if, it, if you keep it short and sweet, they're very easy to close caption. Perfect, and the next one is, what is the size of your online course um, and how to manage the discussion if it's free, open-ended questions, and to get as many people to participate as possible, and do you grade it? So that's a great question, I grade. So every, every week's discussion is 10 points, and that was the rubric that I showed, and so that keeps them participating. Oftentimes they forget to respond to a classmate, which after they lose those points, they 
catch on pretty quickly. Um, but that's probably, you know, I do spend a lot of time grading, unfortunately. I mean, that, that's my least favorite part of teaching. I love lecturing. I love being, you know, working with students. It's the grading. And I just give myself, like, Friday mornings is my grading time where I sit down with, a, you know, a cup of coffee and I just, like, give myself those few hours to grade. Um, but I have, a, I start out with 50 in my class knowing that I have a 30% attrition rate. I think students think online classes are easier. I would beg to disagree with that. I think online classes are much harder. And so students, we know, I always let in extra knowing that I'm gonna, a lot are going to drop out because they don't realize how much harder. And you have to really be self-motivated. I send out reminders all the time to my students, but you still have to know to log in and do the work. There's no one actually verbally telling you to log in and do the work, like in a in a face-to-face -face class. Perfect. And then one more. Um, do you find that students like verbal responses better than rubrics? That's a really good thing. Um, I cannot give verbal responses because then you'd have to close caption it. I know that that's an issue because we are looking at VoiceThread right now. My art history instructors love VoiceThread where the students critique each other's um, art and stuff like that. But that's not closed caption, so we're trying to figure out how to work with voice thread to get that stuff closed captioned. So I do not give verbal responses because they're not closed captioned. So I always type it. So I, by the way, when I use the rubric, I always use the rubric and then underneath I type up a response to them about it. It's not just rubric. What I find frustrating though is when students write to me saying, why did I get a low grade? And I say, did you look, did you read my comments? And they're like, oh, there's comments. And I'm like, oh, he just spent an entire semester giving comments and they didn't read my comments. Um, so, but so I try to do both the rubric and the comments so that I don't just do a rubric. So I think they want to also have a little more information and feedback. Perfect. And could you talk briefly about your philosophy in designing the navigation of the course and show us a slower screen of your course navigation page? Yeah, I am going to, I have to take over the desktop again. Can I do that? Let me transfer it over to you one more time, and you can share your screen. Okay, I'm going to share my desktop. Okay, are you all seeing my screen now? Yes. Okay, so I'm going to go back into my class. So I'm in this class as an instructor. I'm going to move it to student view because it's kind of confusing when you see all the grays all the grade stuff my students don't see. Those are just kind of like my cheat sheets for me. Okay, so this is what my class looks like right now. I, I keep announcements outside, question and answer. That's my link because for my students, I give them the option of the ebook or the um, or using a hard copy. It's really up to them. And then right now, it's the end of semester, so the critique. If you notice, I set it up as a grid by week. And the weeks don't show up until the week until it happens. So it's the end of the semester, so you're seeing every week. But for students, when they log in for the first day of the class, they'll see start here and semester assignments and tutoring, because that's what the, those are always available. And so they'll click start here. Um, otherwise, each Wednesday, another one of these boxes appears, like February 18th, this box appeared, February 25th, the next box appeared. And then I always try to keep everything open because I'm really happy for students to go back and look at material that we've already covered. I do not do a comprehensive final exam because I, um, I just don't think it's important to have them memorize an entire textbook. But I do do exams every three chapters, and those are the really basic multiple choice ones. It's kind of keep them on track, even though I do do the discussion questions. I have the um, final, I have the exams. They're untimed. They can use their books because in my mind, if they're opening up and reading to look for the correct answer, they're actually learning material versus memorizing it to take a timed exam. I have talked to many of my instructors like the timed exams. I tell them if you're concerned about students using books with timed exams, I would do one minute per question. And that way the student really doesn't have an opportunity um, to cheat. Um, another instructor and I just figured out a cheating thing with some students in his class, though, because he had a 75-point exam and one student took it in 20 minutes and got a perfect score, which is it's impossible. You can't even read all the questions in 20 minutes, 75 questions. So, you know, there's ways to set it up. So for every single week, I have, like, introduction, what the objectives are. I have lecture resources, which is the PowerPoint with audio. I go through the key terms. Um, 
I have weekly assignments. Part of my weekly assignments, and I forgot to include that, is I have them do like a crossword or matching or something fun. We have a contract with Soft Chalk. It's not going to let me in because we're already out of it. Oh, I can go to the last week and show it to you. And I love it. It's, it's, it's basically using the glossary of terms, but having them do it as a um, activity. And it's really, really fun for the students because it's just not, it's better than just a, a boring question and answer thing. So I'm going to enter it so you can get a chance to kind of look at it. And this goes right into my grade, grade book. This is this week's, oh, sorry. I think I pulled it down. And so what they do is any potential lethal action again, so they drag it up to, um, to the second, whoops, that was the wrong answer. So and it takes points away every time they get the answer wrong. So even though, like you could keep going until you get the correct answer. Okay, I'm really gonna have a hard time with this one. Maybe it's the next one. Um, this directive peer support, okay. Um, there we go. I had to like find one to get a right answer for you guys. So you get the points, but all those ones that I did wrong, they um, it actually takes points off. So I do something like this or a crossword or just something kind of fun every week with um, terms from that week's um, chapter. So that's under my um, that's under my weekly activities as well. And um, let me go back here. Cooking. So lecture weekly assignments and then other resources or videos. And then I, I sometimes I take the videos and put them into a book. Um, you can go like this. And these are, we also have a contract through telecom, so we can use those too. And so I just have, um, there's different ways to do the videos and, and talk about them. So did that, did I answer that question correctly or did you want more information? No, that was perfect. Um, we have another question that came in. How do you handle academic dishonesty? Do we really know that the student is learning? We have had students hire other students to do their work, and I had one student doing the work for her husband because he was busy, and she actually asked me if this was okay. I love <laughs> using Respondus Monitor. Wow, well, that is great that she actually asked you. Um, so that's similar to what I'm talking about, where we kind of like do it. We have student logs, so one of the things I do is I check the logs, but like you're saying, if they have, if they pay someone to log in for them and do the work for them, there's only so much we can do. Um, one of the reasons why I do the intro is I find that the intro is written by the student themselves because they don't usually have, like, the, when they're going to pay someone to do things, they really pay someone to do more of the assignments. And so that's why I'll link back and forth when I'm grading assignment, the discussions, I'll link back and forth and look at what their intro was, which is grammatically completely incorrect, versus what their discussion is. In the past, this is kind of a funny story. I, I, I was teaching um, an infant class at East LA College, and at the time I had my son at a daycare in the San Fernando Valley, which is where I live, and um, I was reading someone's, um, the, the students had to go and observe um, an infant center, and I was reading the student's observation, and it was all about my son's infant center, and I'm like, oh my gosh, you went to my son's daycare. How funny is that? Such a small world. I'm not used to it because I teach in East LA. It's, you know, an hour and a half away. So when I went to go pick up my son that night, I said, oh, I heard one of my students came to observe because I read her paper, and, she, and the director was like, no, students have been here to observe. And I'm like, no, no, she knew everything about the center. She knew about Mr. Al coming and singing to you guys, and she knew just, it was like so funny, she knew everything. And she, my, the director was like, no, she goes, but you know what, one of the moms here is a student at Valley College, maybe she, she wrote about it and the student plagiarized her, and I was like, oh my God, this is like not good. So then I went and looked on the web to see if I found something about the center, and I did. I found that a whole thing written up about the center that the student had plagiarized word for word. But um, this is kind of sad. My husband is a writer, and he happened to have been the person that wrote what the student plagiarized word for word. And my husband was laughing. He's like, you didn't recognize my writing? And I, of course, did not recognize his writing, but at least I'd given him an A initially when I didn't know it was being plagiarized. But I had to write to the student and say, so not only did you not visit my son's center, but you plagiarized my husband word for word. She ended up dropping the class. That was luck. You're right. I mean, you can't always tell. But I, you know, what I always say to my face-to-face -face instructors who say, you know, how do you know the student's really your student is, I taught a couple times where I keep thinking students were like switching off and they're like, no, I'm two at AM and I'm like feeling stupid. But do you check IDs for every student that walks into your face-to-face -face class? Because 
I don't. And there has been a time when I know students switched, but then I couldn't justify it. And I can't, because it would have turned into a huge issue because I wasn't checking everyone's IDs to suddenly check one student's ID. But um, online, if I suspect something, which is what we did with um, one of our poli-sci classes, those students are coming in and having to do the work in person. So what the instructor said to them is, we suspect that you cheated. We've seen that you all logged in from the same IP address because your LMSs can tell you all that as well, by the way. And so we are having them come in and resubmit three exams in person, like online, but with us there. And so we're giving them that option to do it. Um, out of five students, only one of them is fighting it and coming in to take the exam. So obviously we were lucky to catch it. But he was really diligent. He noticed that there was too, many, too much similar work coming in from all of them. And then he checked the IP address and saw that it was the exact same IP address. Perfect. And then the last question, if anyone has any other questions, please feel free to contact me. Um, but to your knowledge, do these outside links such as Voki uh, and Launchpad work with Schoolology? Ooh, that's a really good question. I don't even know Schoolology. Is that an LMS? I'm looking it up now. Schoolology? Oh, student login. Is that a regular one, or is that one created specifically by a school? Hmm. I am unfamiliar with Schoolology as well. If, if anyone on the line that's listening to this wants to raise their hand and ask further questions about that, feel free to. I know that from a Launchpad point of view, I am the Digital Solutions Specialist for psychology, and if anyone has questions about Launchpad specifically, I would be more than happy to set up a one-on-one -on -one training with you. I know that Wendy did address some of her Launchpad excitement during the presentation, um, but just got a little bit of clarification on this. It is an LMS, and uh, Mohev Community College just purchased it. Schoolology is, 12, uh, is K through 12. Okay, yeah, I just like that you can see. I'm sharing my desktop. I just went on to it and found it. Um, so I don't know about that. Um, I know that a lot of the publishers have packages that are compatible with the um, well-known um, LMSs. So like Moodle and Canvas and Blackboard, that you could actually take their stuff as, as a zip drive and you just upload it right into your site, which is what you saw that I did. Those were all those videos. I didn't individually import them in. I had um, the publisher sent me a zip drive and I just uploaded it right into Moodle. Perfect. And just as a, it looks like we have, there aren't any more questions coming in. No one's raising their hand. Um, so, okay, perfect. That helped clarify the question that was originally asked. Um, but just feel free to, uh, we just launched our TLC symposium on that um, brand new TLC community that each of you logged into to sign up for this WebEx. So feel free to follow us there and continue reaching out. This is a community in which you can ask us questions, um, the editors, the publishers, everyone that's incorporated into the TLC community. It's an open forum for sharing resources as well. So please let me know if you have any questions. Like I said, you will be getting a follow-up email directing you to the community so that you can re-watch this recorded training if you'd like. And Wendy's slides will be posted there as well if you want any, um, if you want to examine them any further. I wanted to give you guys the link to my um, closed captioning. So I will add that before I send the slides, I'll add the link to um, how to close caption. Perfect. Well, thank you so much, everyone. It's been a pleasure, and contact us if you do have any further questions.